The following episode contains or may contain spoilers. So if you're spoiler sensitive, maybe beware. Yeah, you sensitive people. Get out. (laughs) (laughs) No, get in. Welcome to the Fandom Zone. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Man, you couldn't make it one sentence. I couldn't. Welcome to the Phantom Zone. Three fans, one podcast, and a sea of comics. Uh, I'm Noah. Uh, I'm Jared, and I believe you mean two fans. Oh, yeah. Kayla's two not fans. on this one. She is very held up in Scotland doing Scottish things. And will not be able to join us, but all is well that ends well, because this episode she, is perfect for just us two to do. That's right. She's here in spirit, and I should say, I think that it's going to be common when we do these like deeper dives on particular stories, that there might be less of us than you're used to, just because the odds of us all reading <laughs> one mm-hmm. story, yeah. <laughs> even though we're familiar with the general territory it's like harder to find something we've all like we know equally well yeah especially when we get outside of marvel and dc um yeah it gets a little less common um but we might have guests on and who knows but as hey we have an episode out and it's worth it <laughs> so uh, absolutely i'm also sick again i feel like almost every other episode i'm saying i'm sick welcome to new york where everybody's sick and gets you sick so that's fun. Um, yeah, a big part of New York is having a homeless person on the train uh, sneeze in your mouth. That's a big one. <laughs> that's actually how you get on the train. Um, so, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, sick. So bear with me, Jared and listeners. Um, and then I did also want to say that our 2020 giveaway ended. The person that won it contacted us. Um, so they are going to be getting... Whatever they want from a comic shop, up to 60 bucks, and we have giveaways every now and then. Just so you guys know, if you're a Patreon member, you get entered into every single one, regardless if you actually do what we're asking you to do. <laughs> so. 60, 60 bucks uh, full from any comic I can name from a comic store, that's such a good deal, by the way. I mean, I know, I know it's our deal, so it's like I'm biased here, but mm-hmm. like I would love to get that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm technically a Patreon too, and I'm <laughs> bummed I didn't win. <laughs> well, I mean, if you think about it, sixty bucks trades are anywhere from ten dollars to let's say twenty. So I mean, that's a good, good, good amount of trades if you want to get that, or a statue, or a T-shirt. What I mean, you know, it's whatever. Yeah, it's like you get the thing you wouldn't get yourself because I would definitely get some crazy ass hardback shit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think they actually asked for a pretty big compendium of um, some X-Men stories. So that's cool. Um, great pick. Yeah, great pick. Um, and that's that's really all the announcements I have. And also, thank you, anybody that's on Patreon that does it. I mean, we, we put out exclusive episodes every week or every other week. And you all keep are keeping, keeping on on there. <laughs> I have a lot of drugs in my system. Anyway, moving on to this week's episode, which is, did you get it from the teaser? Because it was super easy. I don't know how anybody <laughs> could not have guessed <laughs> what it is. It's lock and key. It's lock and key. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, very true. That teaser, I got to pick those images out very hard. What's interesting, I do maintain, if you have read this story you probably would have connected those dots. Um, But that's the nature of the story, because if you haven't read it, it, it's not the most um, salient thing. No. You you know, it's one of those things, hopefully you've heard of this, everybody needs to read it. Um, Yeah, I mean, whenever, when it was first released, the the first round of printing, they sold out within a day and immediately ordered a second printing. So, I mean... It's crazy. I feel like a lot of people don't know about this, but a lot of people do at the same time, which is weird. Or at least read it a long time ago. Well, a a good way to think about it, I think, is that um, 
independent comic books from independent publishers, that, especially ones that aren't in the superhero genre, um, aren't are going to be just less known. They're just less popular and less read. But of those, Lock and Key is one of the most popular. Oh yeah. Um, and it's in some ways exciting for us on this podcast to get to talk about this because you know we love superheroes. There's no question. Make no apologies about it. But you know, and, and that just dominates the comic culture. But you know, there are these stories, this being one of them, that absolutely floor us. Um, I know Noah and I both love this. And I wanted to say before we get too like into it, um, you know, the Netflix show is coming out mm-hmm. and we're uh we can talk about that later. I'm actually end, more happy. About. I'm happy it's coming out because like you were saying, it gives us an opportunity to talk about this. I That's mean absolutely right. trying to talk about horror and comics. I mean, we can do whatever the fuck we want. But, I mean, most of the time people come on here looking for superhero stuff or there's a theme or, you know, there's another superhero movie coming out. So, anytime there's something slightly obscure or in one of the niches niches that we like, I mean, I get excited. I remember we talked about doing this episode in the beginning and we were hoping that, you know, Kayla would end up reading it, which it's a pretty big series to just pick up and read, but... Yeah. The Netflix show coming out and her time is up. So sorry, we're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's absolutely true that, that it's like um, to pick, if we just like said we want to like pick some horror story or independent story, it would have been really hard to justify doing it without that show. Mm-hmm. But the show absolutely was sort of like, okay, this is going to be at least somewhat, you know, in the kind of like zeitgeist. So it gives us an opportunity. Um, and and what I was going to say is that, and sort of to mirror your comment, we're just really lucky because for me, um, and I can't speak for you, I know you, you love this, but for me, this is in like my top five comics. Like I can say that with confidence. I'd say my top 20, but I mean... Uh, how many comics Which, there are there's that's pretty that's pretty high up there yeah <laughs> yeah that's that's top 20 of a thousand yeah. so that's, a, <laughs> yeah. that's still yeah. kind of an amazing story um so we can let's i mean do you want to kind of get into that least like the kind of summary yeah so i mean to give what we'll, people who, yeah what we'll do and i do want to preface this with not necessarily a trigger warning um but this the story is written by joe hill and that's Stephen King's son, and like father, Absolutely. like son, his material is very heavy. Not only is it usually well written, the character development's always good, but it deals with themes like sexual abuse and violence and stuff like that. So it's a little more mature than what we normally talk about. So I just wanted to throw that out there in case some of those themes are, you know, some people are a little sensitive to those themes because sexual. Sexual abuse does happen, and probably what we're about to start getting to talk about. <laughs> so, just wanted to th- throw that out there. But yeah, I mean, great point, and I'm glad you you brought that up. And I'll be honest, and, and I was going to make this point earlier anyway. Uh, so you said, you know, it's a big undertaking to read this, you know, just to do the podcast. Honestly, in a week's time, I reread it for like oh, the yeah. third or fourth time, yeah. <laughs> and it's so good mm-hmm. again. I mean, but we're gonna gush in more particulars. Um, but uh, th- to your point, uh, yeah, it's way worse than I remember in in yeah. terms of like the the darkness and trauma and the pull no punches and like oh my god that character got murdered. I did not see that coming. It that it's like peppered throughout this book. The book does not let up. Yeah, I want to. I do want to say, I mean, it's kind of just going over like a brief summary or like generalization of the book up top. This, it's a little different from even superhero comics when people die, because a lot of times when characters die in comics, especially superhero comics, they're like vaporized. So you don't really see it. You get, you get like yeah. laser beams and then they disintegrate, whatever. And lock and key, like you have people like bashing another person's face in with a brick. So like, it seems a little more not only like realistic in a weird way, but just more humanized. Like this, in it, not in a more realistic world. Does that make sense? I don't know. That makes per- perfect sense. And like, without further ado, let's kind of get into this a little bit. So, um, locking the key is basically a story. Um, it, we've kind of. I'm not going to tell the whole thing, obviously, <laughs> uh, though I'd love to. Um, but the, the the basic idea is that there's this family uh, with you know mother, father, three kids. Their last name is Locke, 
and um the father it's a, they're very conventional um they have they go to school uh, the father is a um guidance counselor um he ha- and and what kicks off our story is that he has a very troubled um a uh, student named Sam Lesser, who ends up being, uh, you know, a, a psychotic person, who ends up murdering um, uh, Rendell Locke, the father. Uh, that's uh, that begins our story right away. Obviously, spoilers, <laughs> but but <laughs> they always to, get that. But, but to be honest, <laughs> exactly. And also, this is the beginning. So this is I'm within you know, the, this first, is the premise like, of our ten story. pages. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's it's basically our first issue, and um and after this trauma, uh, the the family go back to a house um that the that the Locke family sort of owns, like something that was sort of bequeathed to them. It's you know, originally sort of vague, but the idea is that their um, uncle Duncan, who's a very important character, uh, side character, has sort of been keeping the grounds. It's like almost a classic horror thing, mm-hmm. you know, where it's like, oh, my, you know, grandfather left me a haunted mansion. Well, in in that case, this is, that's essentially what happens. And the family goes to stay there. And what the children come to find is that the house is not haunted in the in the typical sense, but it's populated by these magical keys. Mm-hmm. And each key sort of when applied in the right way, oftentimes uh, into the right lock or by the right person, bequeaths a certain gift. We're going to get into those later or it gives a certain power or ability or something mm-hmm. like that. It unlocks and something new. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Because it's a key. But it, get it? But uh, yeah, exactly. But unfortunately, for the family, uh, they are also uh, not alone. Uh, there's a sort of ancient evil and a historical evil, mm-hmm. you know that that is thwarting the the kids. Now, the, and the story is primarily about these three kids. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, for sort of so some reasons we'll get into. Um, but yeah, it's. I mean, so that's our basic setup. And yeah, murder. To, family has to relocate for some fucking reason. Why does that always happen? Like somebody dies, and then they're like, "Well, I guess we have to go live in this creepy old house that they had in their family that we never went to the entire time they were alive." <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, uh, I mean, you're absolutely right. I think so. That's. I mean, that's a great question. Like, why does it? Why? Because it's a classic uh, it's horror a trope, setup. Yeah. And. Yes. And I think, well, I mean, for one, I think because, especially in this case, because horror almost always deals with death in some sense, Mm -hmm. fear and death and trying to cope with that anxiety. And so to begin our story in the wake of that murder is just like part and parcel and really like primes you for like, this is the subject we're going to deal with, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Um, It also, I think, is interesting because it kind of catches these characters really like in like we're getting it's a slice of life for sure but it's it's this life slice of life where they're the most in crisis Mm. and like living a kind of heightened reality because of that yeah like they're dealing with shit Mm -hmm. uh (laughs) um it it reminds me of um uh, what is it, a streetcar named desire with blanche duvois where the play opens and she's already up to her neck (laughs) You know, mm-hmm. in uh, uh, about to lose it, and that's where we get to see the family start. And and I mean, we're we're going to talk more about the themes as we go on, but I think we just because it begins like so much of this is about dealing with trauma and grief that sort of infuses our entire story. Um, and uh, oh, I wanted to mention too because you mentioned this was Joe Hill. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is Stephen King's son. Yep. Um. Is I mean I think this is better than anything Stephen King wrote. I know that's like okay. Well, kind you of can just sign off and <laughs> never come back on again. <laughs> well, I I I I mean, it's highly arguable, I'm sure, and critically, that would be hard to like. I'm not going to get a consensus after you've got things like it and uh, Pet Cemetery and The Shining, <laughs> but I think that what I want to kind of like emphasize is that this is not just the this is not Joe Biden's son, the writer. You know what I oh, mean? Oh, yeah. Like, he, like, really holds his own. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's probably, is. I mean, I'm sure that's why he has a different pen name. I mean, he, he, yeah. he not only, I mean, he, he really carved out his own type of writing, his own type of, you know, way to tell horror stories. I love that he does horror, just like his dad. But, I mean, 
it goes to show you that, I mean, he really made his mark, especially in the graphic novel universe. Currently, he's the one that's headwaying Hill House Comics under DC. Once they absolved yeah. Vertigo, pretty much Joe Hill took over their whole horror line. Oh, that was a hard thing to say. Malsic. <laughs> whole horror line. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, uh, he, it's, he's you've great. Said, the way it sounds like you're saying something pornographic. I, I just want to be clear. It goes with the material we're talking about today. Um, and I did That's want to great. make note that Gab- Gabriel Rodriguez is the artist behind it. Phenomenal art. I mean, it's it's so good. He, I, I believe he actually did architecture uh, prior to doing this artwork. And that's why all of the buildings in this comic are amazing. Just going to say that. <laughs> I, I, you're absolutely right. I didn't even notice that. Yeah. But you say it and it instantly occurs to me. I mean, uh, the well house, mm-hmm. uh, which is important to this, uh, I, there's so many diagrams of it. And I was always like, I wonder why they have that. And now, okay, I totally get it. Yep, because he can just whittle those that's things out. <laughs> A, li- a little bit more on him. I want to say one. Um, you know, the whole art team is is great here. The inker, the color, uh, a colorist, uh, colorator, color I mean, Anyway, uh, yeah, yeah. Gr- I mean, fantastic work. Um, and I think it's really wonderful that in the, this is a self contained series. Mm-hmm. So it's Joe Hill and uh, Rodriguez working together the whole time. With modern comics, uh, you know, because of um, dates, like trying to keep the date, uh, are very quick to like. Uh, even in, within a single story or a single run, mm-hmm. changed the artist out. And it's really, I mean, almost unfortunate. I understand their editorial demands, mm-hmm. but when then you get a book where it's in uh, two people who've worked together for the entire series yeah. and develop a kind of art language over the course, uh, you, it's it's a completely immersive experience in a way you kind of lose when you don't have that. Mm-hmm. Um, Oh, and and uh, I mean, uh, you may have more, but I, last thing I'll, I'll say about uh, Rodriguez, I think what's underappreciated, because uh, he's good at so many things, he's good at these wonderful blood-dripping, shadowy imagery, so many cool things, but the, his faces, mm-hmm. to me, absolutely make this series- Especially um, when they're like in utter horror or in utter madness, it's amazing. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And I think, I think there's a way that he is- um, you know, it's not utter realism. He'll often um, do kind of caricature faces, expressive things, but it, it gives every single character, and this is such a character-based comic, um, every character a very specific look with very specific features. So, you know, you immediately know who it is uh, by how they emote. And yeah, it's, I think it's an unsung virtue of this comic mm-hmm. is how good he is with boring out character through facial work. But anyway, yeah, I do, um, <laughs> do want to say too, that um, the, the way this story is collected, it's like six issues per like a little trade or so. And there's yeah. how many, there's like one, two, three, four, five, six, three, six. Yep. Yeah. There's six books. And then there's also one shots. There's three one shots. The Guide to the Known Keys, Grindhouse, and Small World. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I've been told, and i have reading things and people that I've talked to about this, they're like, if you want to get a taste of it to see if it's something you like, go to the one-shots, because it kind of just breaks everything down a little bit, and it's very, like, palpable and sample stuff to see if it's something you're interested in. I mean, I always say just dive right in, but that's also an option for you to do if you want to read this. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I think I, I'm kind of of both minds here. I agree that's a good way. I also think this story is so uh, gripping from the beginning to the end. If you pick up the first issue, uh, if you're a fan of story, <laughs> mm-hmm. much less comic stories, I really just see you, like, you know, doing eating it as fast as your wallet will allow you to eat it. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, and I wanted to mention uh, one more thing, I guess, before we get into sort of some particulars. Um, which is just about how impressive the tone is in this entire series. Mm-hmm. Um, I always appreciate it when it feels like the creative team, you know, in this case, especially the writer, can tell you different kinds of stories within one larger story arc. Mm-hmm. And there are moments in this story that are as poignant uh, as like Calvin and Hobbes, like very Bill Watterson. Mm-hmm. Um, 
it is it is and then they're clearly very terrifying and very um anxiety uh creating sort of inducing moments too mm-hmm. and it really does both and it's really funny because like a lot of shitty superficial horror is very prone to not be able to have the emotional gravity that this has so anyway just uh that i guess it's the last overly generalized gushing i'm gonna do about the comic <laughs> yeah i mean i'm sure we'll <laughs> gush as we go on but these type of episodes let us freely gush about the things that we yeah. like the most um i mean did you want to get into specifics or kind of break down the story a little more yeah let's so um well we can kind of do one by doing two so basically as we say uh their father's killed um, I do want to Rendell, which by the way, yeah, I love that name. I, but go I do want to say, can we talk about how his father's killed? Cause yeah, I, that's, that's a good point. Um, I think so as I mentioned, yeah. it was, a, it was one, one of his um, troubled sort of kids. Um, but it's, uh, or actually, why don't you, why don't you take the lead on this? One? Yeah. So um, Tyler, the oldest um, kid of the three. So you have Tyler Kinsey, the girl, and then okay. So I always thought, uh, okay, <laughs> I knew I knew you were gonna <laughs> go here when we got yeah, to him. So I always said Bode because it's B O D E. I thought it was Bode, and also yeah. I don't know anybody with this name. But the Netflix show that's coming out, they call him Bode, and I'm like, well, that sounds stupid. Bode sounds better. So I'm just gonna say Bode. I agree. <laughs> I might, I might too. I have to admit, it probably is Bode, just because I imagine Joe Hill was a consultant on it mm, on the show. Well, no, he's yeah, he's but, a huge hand in it, so I'm pretty sure they pronounce it. Right. Yeah, but yeah, I almost I, two things on that is like uh, put an I in there. That's how English works. Uh, yeah. very clearly. Or two E's. Uh, I mean, yeah, or two. Yeah, there's a, there was a thousand ways to indicate with that a Y, it's maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but so it's yeah, anyway. It's kind of uh, so agree. Tyler yeah. the oldest, Kinsey the middle, and then Bode. Um, uh, to give long story short, like Jared had said, the father is a counselor at the school. Um, I think a night prior, Tyler had taken Kinsey to like a a, a older kid party. There was an accident. They got in trouble because he put his sister in in jeopardy. And then his father told Tyler that he couldn't go on a trip that he was looking for. Um, yeah. One of Tyler's kind of friends, I believe his name was Sam, I think, something like that. Um, anyway, he's really pissed off his dad. Of course, when you're that age, telling no and being grounded and a trip ruined is the end of the world for you. He's outside talking to this guy and this other guy is letting him know that he hates his dad too. He's also more in a troubled home than Tyler is. Tyler's just first world problems being upset. Um, and his friend is actually from a terrible home, but Tyler says kind of jokingly and in the fit of rage, it's like, well, if you ever plan to kill your dad, put my dad on the list too. And turn of a- yeah, And he's being very, he's being very hyperbolic. Yes. You know, I mean, like, you know, it's really clear that he's unaware that the person he's talking to Sam Lesser is, you know, a, a homicidal, uh, you know, sociopath. Well, to be fair, it's not, I mean, he is kind of, but the main villain of the story takes that seed of anger and motivation yeah. and puts it into effect. So he's under, yeah, I think yeah, he's, he's manipulated. Yeah. He's manipulated sure. his, his original feelings are amplified and he ends up killing his father or parents and then the Sam guy gets this other guy that's with him, his other friend. He's not possessed at all. He's just a fucking lunatic. Um, yeah, yeah. He goes to the the lock house and try, starts murdering his parents. So this is where it gets a little heavy. Um, Sam is trying to murder his dad. Tyler's outside wit- witnessing it happen. He sees the other guy take his mom into the room. His mom's getting sexually abused by this other guy. Um, the two kids are on the roof hiding. Sam ends up killing his dad, and then Tyler ends up killing the guy that was sexually assaulting his mom. So, no, no, that's not true. What? Uh, it's she kills the she kills him. Oh yeah, with the ha- the axe or hatchet or something. Yeah, yeah. Who did that's he right. hit with the yeah. brick? Was it Sam? He just didn't kill him. It was Sam. Oh okay. It was Sam. Yeah. It looked like he, he killed he, him. 
<laughs> nearly kills he nearly kills him right and then that's why his face is so messed up right 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 right, right. so correct so that's where we leave off so not only are these kids dealing with trauma of these crazy people breaking in killing their parents sexually assaulting their mother but also having to move so there's a lot of emotions that you're given right up front and yeah just an incredible upheaval yeah uh, to every, I mean, not just their their life. You know, you mentioned the moving. It is funny because it's like if they just had to move under normal c- circumstances, that can be really traumatic for for kids, especially if it, it's something sudden. And then to have their their father obviously murdered, and then to have their mom go through this incredible trauma and everything like that. It's a huge world of shit. Yeah, and the mom um, throughout the entire that. story deals with it. So not only losing her husband, but dealing with the the sexual assault that she. She endured, and, and it's the way it's written is is really good. I mean, it's bad. I have to no. tell you, I, when I reread this, I I didn't know she was sexually assaulted. Yeah, I didn't realize that the first time I read it because there's so much going on in those scenes, mm-hmm. and you're really worried. I mean, you're like, oh my god, he's the, these characters are about to die. You don't really. I mean, you just gotten to know these. Uh, characters and you have no idea what the book is capable of Mm -hmm. so for all we know this is the story of a family being murdered and then we're going to do something later right you know what i mean um so it it really is a terrifying um experience uh when you're first reading it but um yeah so i didn't realize and i have to just give it special points i think for handling that really well they easily could have made this overly graphic and showed that assault in a way that i think would have been grotesque and not to the service of the story mm-hmm. but it's handled with a lot of sincerity and discretion so it's like i think that's i think you know you mentioned a trigger warning beforehand uh in a sense this is like meant for people who i don't want to say exposure therapy that's too much but in other words this is a story that in features a sexual assault where i think for the most part a person who was a victim of sexual assault could still actually read it and not feel you know paralyzed by that or something yeah like that. i mean it um, like you're saying i mean it doesn't show it explicitly when it's happening it's more like an inferred type thing that happens um and then you could tell by the way she's dealing with it and some of the things she says later on that that's what happened to her that she was you know raped so yeah they mention it too. yeah Yeah, yeah. so i mean Uh, it it, i think he does do a beautiful job of taking a terrible thing and the way he has her process it and what she goes through is very true to how this would happen or it doesn't it doesn't make it a joke or anything you know what i mean it's he does it very well with what he wrote so 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 okay, so we put all that on the table, and uh, we haven't really even gotten to the keys yet oh, and God. the magic of this book. It's literally a kind of horror, magic, uh, you know, fantasy mm-hmm. story. Um, but but there's reason for that because again, the story is so grounded in realism, so well handled, so ex- uh, expertly executed that you know it, it, that's it's got all this awesome groundwork before you even get to the magical elements. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so the the like I said, the house key house it's called by the way, um, is um, uh, populated by these keys. But the thing is, they're slowly revealed over the course of the narrative, um, and there's a kind of abiding magic that's infused over the whole thing. So they almost have a mind of their own, and they generally there's a couple things I actually think is worth mentioning here. There's a thing called Riffle's rules. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and uh, going along with that. So the idea is that only kids, once they have experiences with the magic of these keys can remember over a period of time, the, the keys, uh, if, after you turn an adult, you lose this memory. And that's why his um, dad didn't remember. That's right. We, it's a detail. It's kind of hard to like a lot of this is told in flashback. So it's hard for us. No one. I'm, I mean, to kind of know where to start. Um, we find out that the, the the father when he was young um you know obviously the uh uh recently deceased father when he was young he and his cohort of friends um you know uh, had experiences with keys and everything like that too mm-hmm. but they've since lost a memory of it yeah um, i do want to say i do want to point out before yeah, people do. are like well what are these keys where they come from um yeah. the original keys were made by benjamin locke during the 18th century during the revolutionary right. war so yeah, I, I can't remember. I think it was made from like whispering iron or something like that. Some magical. That's right. we'll get, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll get we'll get to where that stuff comes from in in a bit. But yes, that's mm-hmm. true. It dates way back all the way to the Revolutionary War. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, so so again, Riffle's rule apply. Only the kids 
um, can remember it. And in many ways, only the unless it's an extreme example, only the kids can see the magic. Yeah. Um, uh, the effects of the keys. It's, it's, the idea is the adults are just less inclined towards it. And then the other thing is that the keys don't. They sort of intentionally reveal themselves. Uh, to the per- to people that are the least dangerous, so they usually re- uh, reveal themselves. The person who finds them is Bode. <laughs> yeah, most of the time. Yeah, with the I think the uh, first one was the ghost key, and if you've seen the, the ghost, key. yeah, and if you see in the trailer, that's when he like unlocks the door and then he like floats out. That's the ghost key. You become a ghost, <laughs> essentially. That's right. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that because we okay. So there's pro- there's easily a dozen and a half keys. We're not going to go through all Good of God, them, but no. I, I do want to kind of g- yeah, exactly. I do want to give you a, a kind of a taste uh, uh, of like one. So the uh, Noah's right. The first key that, that's discovered um, is the ghost key, and the idea is it again. Uh, different keys correspond to different locks or or doors or something like that. Or body In this parts. case. Or body parts. Uh, in this case, it's it's a um, it's on a one door, and the idea is you open that, you turn the key, open the door, and when you go through it, your spirit leaves your body. Your body falls to the ground in a kind of coma-like state, um, and you get to go all you know, essentially anywhere you think of as the as a ghost and it's just it's basically a kind of cast it's super useful apparition. if your body wasn't just laying there waiting to be killed or eaten like that's right i mean yeah, yeah it's yeah, more yeah. of like it's just a way to introduce them i will point out though can i tell like what are the most important keys or at least the driving force behind this story Sure. yeah, yeah absolutely. so there's the omega key which is like the first key that was made and that's the one that our antagonist, Dodge, is after. And also the yes. other key that they are after is the Anywhere key. And the Anywhere key, essentially, you whatever you can clearly picture a place in your mind, you put it in any door, unlock it, and you'll be at that place. Um, and then that's the right. Omega key is the key to the black door. And and we'll 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 get into that right, later, right, right. but 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 absolutely. But he but uh, Noah's uh, I think very right to point it out because it is a kind of MacGuffin for the story. Our villain uh, Dodge uh, uh, is sort of hunting that for the most of our story. Mm-hmm. So it's a kind of like antagonist's MacGuffin. I wanted to mention a few more uh, keys that are just very frequent in um, the story. Like again, there are all kinds of other keys. There are keys that make you three times stronger. There's keys that give you flight via wings there's keys that the make you key. 60 feet tall the giant exactly key. there's all the <laughs> yeah, exactly and the Her- and hercules key uh there's an animal key where you get to become your spirit okay. animal so many i cool want to know about oh so the animal key like yeah do you get to choose which animal because it's not very clear no okay no you you don't you don't because remember when bode goes through the door um i'm glad you mentioned this just because it's such a beautiful little moment um uh, he he's like I'm gonna be this or I'm gonna be a gorilla or anything like that and goes through it and he's a little sparrow. Oh, that's right. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And and then they go into Bode's perspective a little bit and it's more cartoonish. The art becomes more cartoonish. It's a clear reference to Bill Watterson's Calvin and Hobbes and it's absolutely beautiful. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> just thought it would be worth uh, mentioning. Can you um, tell he likes but, this? So we have. Just, just I uh, I love yeah exactly. I love both. But uh, so um, yeah, so we have those. All kinds of keys, but another major one is a is a the head key, mm. and um, I think you've seen it just a little bit in the trailer, and it ha- it's such a wonderful device. It's one of the most original pieces of this, I think, in terms of like a little magical system. When you hold the head key, a um, a keyhole forms, you know, on your the back of your neck, or or any of the surround. You can use it on other people too, um, on and when you. Uh, open. Oh, actually, I'm going to let you say it, uh, Noah, because I've been sort of like. Yeah, I mean, a, a keyhole opens on the back of your neck because gross, and then <laughs> your head opens up, and it's like mm-hmm. everybody's head is different because everybody is different, and yeah. the coolest. I mean, not the the coolest thing, but also the worst thing about this is you can literally pluck memories out of people's heads. That's right. Or also change <clears throat> change them. So. Yeah, you can put new stuff in there. So if you like want to learn how to play guitar, you can put a guitar manual in your head. Yeah, you can literally take objects from the outside world and shove it in the head. 
I mean, yeah. where was this in college? I don't <laughs> like. Yeah, yeah, no. Well, what's what's wonderful, and I we can um, get into this a little bit more, but uh, I, what I love about this is that for most of the narrative, the keys don't really solve their problems. Nope. Um, the keys can be used as weapons and different devices and tools, but most of their major problems, they kind of don't work on, at least in terms of like, you know, the writing is good enough that the, their conflicts are complicated enough that like the keys end up not being this sort of magic wand. So a good example to speak to this point is that Tyler, the oldest um, son and, and kind of our protagonist in a lot of ways, um, he uh, tries to pass uh, write a paper. And so he puts like the book in his head and gets an F on the paper and the note back is sort of like, yeah, you've memorized all this stuff, but it, there's no like, you don't understand anything. Yeah, he's kind of just so, like copying and pasting from the book. Yeah, I mean, at one point, Bode puts a a, a, a cookbook in his yeah. head and, and he's like uh, telling the recipe for, I don't know, like, let's say to make a pie. And he's like, you know, it's 30 tisps. <laughs> Of of so, or, or three tisps of of sugar, and he's like, "What's a tisp?" <laughs> so he doesn't have the very context yeah. that it's a tablespoon. He needs to put also a dictionary in his head. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's uh, oh, that would be yeah, that's good idea unto itself. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the way this that the I guess the tool in this story works. The keys do different things. They don't necessarily correspond to a door, but they correspond to a body part or a person or. Anything like that, or another object, or another object, correct? Um, and 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 one final one I wanted to mention, just because we see it so much, it ends up being a kind of uh, really big uh, tool. Is the the key for the shadow crown? Mm, right, right, right. Um, it's we again. It's it's sort of like not as um, I don't know story driven. Uh, but it's you've, we've already seen it in the trailer. Uh, you just see it a lot. And basically, it, there's a, a crown that you can wear. It was sort of. Uh, at the bottom like some in some sort of chamber at the bottom of the house um and a key goes into that crown and when you wear it you can control all the shadows so the shadows become like sentient they become like physical forms um you know and uh you got you know, it's almost like sh- lantern or something like yeah, that yeah you just get a bunch and, of minions yeah mm-hmm. and it's like one of the more powerful like sort of instantiations mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, there's also one just fun fact. There's one called the gender key, which is used a few times. And, um, totally you can, if you're a boy and go through the door with the gender key, you could be a woman or hell you could be neither. I mean, whatever you want to do, because our main antagonist is, I don't know what they are. So, <laughs> yeah. well, that, yeah, it's funny. Cause like, I think it would be funny if you like, if you weren't, if you were gender neutral, mm-hmm. You know, it's like you were gender neutral, but then it like made you gender fluid. Mm, you know what I mean? Like, right, right, right. Like, <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I wanted to say before we kind of move uh, on too much further. So those are, those are kind of the keys, right? And that's kind of how they work. There's a lot we didn't talk about. A lot of that's like, for them cool to find out. Mysteries discovered. Yes, uh, but I want to say a little bit more about our characters. Like, I want to spend a little bit of time because again, this book really focuses on the you know development of these kids as characters and like how they deal with you know both this traumatic reality they've that's in the wake and the fact that there's this villain that's trying to like kill them and as it turns out kind of in the world a little bit Mm -hmm. you know um but so our first and i think the closest to a protagonist even though it is a bit more of an ensemble cast is is tyler locke um and i don't know uh, like what do you, you want to explain tyler i mean he's just like he's like jason from the power rangers i mean <laughs> yeah i mean that's yeah. his character type like he's the older brother he has to be tough he always has to have his shit together he always has to make sure everybody's okay like and with his mom going through this trauma he has to be you know the man of the house and you know he feels overwhelmed i mean i would too he's like what a senior in high school or something like that and he yeah. You now he has to deal with all this stuff. He feels like he's never going to be able to leave. So it's kind of one of That's those, right. like, he has to be the silent sentinel and just kind of deal with everybody's shit and nobody really cares about his. Yeah, a, mo- a lot of the kind of basic, like, he becomes the emotional scaffolding that everybody has to kind of, like, uh, you know, hang their shit mm-hmm. on. And you're, you're right. I mean, and I should say, like, um, the the... 
tropes, the sibling tropes in this are well preserved. You know, like Ty, like the oldest is very much you know like the classic older Leader. sibling. <laughs> Yeah, and um, but but he, it's well written enough that you don't feel like it's overly cliche. Oh, it right, really feels right. like you know these. Are, yeah, um, so yeah, Tyler is definitely that guy that, con- and he's the one that kind of always rushes to everybody's aid. You know, he's always being he's reliable, the hero, he's but a he, reliable guy. Yes, but he also feels like a fuck up all the time. Right, <laughs> you know what I mean? And he feels like and and uh, as as Noah mentioned earlier. He holds a lot of guilt about his father's death. One that, like, I don't think that he really believes that he is the reason that Sam killed his dad. But I think that he just feels guilty because he was so mad at his dad right before he was killed. Like, in other words, he feels bad. Yeah, that I don't he think kind he ever wanted really, that to happen. Yeah, I don't think he ever really put it together or thought too much into that because then his life hit, hit the fucking fan anyway, shortly after. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's that's Tyler. You you very much get him, and I also love that he's not the smartest in a kind of like tactical sense, but he kind of has the most kind of like horse sense, you know, the most common sense. Um, so he actually ends up being like not a he's kind of a jock, but he's he's clever when he needs to be. Anyway, um, so next is Kenzie, a uh, classic middle child. As as a middle child, Noah, do you want to explain Kinsey? <laughs> I don't know what that was supposed to mean or what that tone meant, but middle childs are, you are the best. You are a middle child. She's That's the true. best character in the whole thing because she's a middle child because middle childs are the best. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's as it, as it happens. No, Kinsey would probably agree with you. Yeah, I mean, I think kind of just like a typical middle child, she doesn't necessarily know who she is, where she fits in. She's always causing yeah. trouble. She's much nicer and better at things than she realizes she is or wants to be. Um, I mean, when it comes down to it, especially with these three siblings, they're always there for each other. I think she has some of the wavering moments, but that's just how a middle child is. They always just want somebody to fucking recognize them. Mom. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and and also, I mean, like, she's, um, I don't know, and this is a bit uh, maybe overly gendered, but it, it it's certainly a kind of, like, stereotypical case. She want, She's the most um, of the three that wants to live a normal life mm-hmm. and pretend like everything is normal. Right, right, right. Um, and kind of shut out. As a matter of fact, there's a, um, I don't want to give you too much specifics here, but the, um, she spends a lot of time, we'll say, uh, running away and blocking out, even through magical means, her fear and her sadness. Mm-hmm. Um, so in a lot of ways, I think Kinsey is like her, a lot of her motivation or her conflict is trying to like kind of accept the fact that she doesn't have a normal life, that her circumstances are crazy and also very dark and difficult and that you know and and to balance this but she's also uh, in a lot of ways for the the series um a ray of sunlight and it's really good because i mean tyler keeps is you know everything so heavy and dour and he's always brooding i mean he's like batman right you know? right um yeah she's a little bit more batgirl yeah. in that respect um <laughs> and then I mean, Boat is just Boat. I mean, he's the young kid. He thinks the keys are awesome, he's and great. he finds them. And yeah. he, you know, I mean, there's really not much to say about him. I mean, he's a great character. I mean, just without he's precocious. And, yeah, I mean, and, he yeah. just he loves the magic. He also hates the magic. He's the one that, when we get to our villain, kind of is the reason the villain comes back. Like, I mean, that's, but that's right. because I mean, he's naive. They have- I mean. That's right. And they have to protect Boat a lot. And that's true. I mean, his naivete does get them in a lot of trouble. Um, I'm glad you mentioned that. I didn't think about it's very true. He does love the keys. Yeah. In a way that the rest of them don't, uh, you know, because they're either like tools to do something with or like a huge responsibility mm-hmm. that's getting them killed. But there's that's cool because in a way, Boat is a little bit like us as comic book fans. Right. You right, know, because right. we're, we're, I mean, at some level, it's like, you know, we're, at least prima facie attracted to this story because it's like, oh shit, the keys do magic. If I just you know got I mean? the gender key, you know how much fun I would have with that? I mean, come on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Jeez, these yeah. people acting like they wouldn't want it. Be quiet. 
I, I love, by the way, I love that there's, um, there are flashbacks to Rendell, the dad's life, and his younger brother, Duncan, is, uh, is gay. Mm-hmm. And he's, he's their uncle, uh, you know, and he's a really cool side character. He's really wonderful, like, cause he's just a little bit older than them, than the kids. Um, and he, they were, they just had, they say that he always liked to play with a gender key when he was little. Yeah. And they show him as a little girl and everything like that. It's very sweet. Mm-hmm. I, I really yeah. like that. Um, and then I think uh, there's a bunch of other uh, characters. There's two more I think we should discuss. One, just briefly, is Nina Locke, um, and that's their mom. And, you know, she really is a sad character because she was an addict. You know, they, they even mentioned bef- she was a drunk or at least a, a kind of tendency towards substance she had abuse her and alcoholism. Exactly. Before this trauma happens. After it happens, she becomes really a hopeless alcoholic, and the kids end up taking care of her, you know, more than she does them many, in many ways. Yeah, hence why Bode was trying to cook because his mom doesn't even cook anymore. So yeah, yeah. Um, now you can overstate this a little bit because she's still very functional in a lot of ways, and she still really takes care of them and very clearly loves them the whole time. So. You know, I actually think she's a relatively complex and well crafted character. Um, but that is kind of her function, unfortunately. She's also, as an adult, she's kind of the reality around this whole thing in that, like, you know, she doesn't see the magic yeah. and she doesn't know what the, is up to. And, you know, like they're, they're doing these magical things with the keys, but it, I think she's an important element of the story because it reminds us, like, oh, they're, it's a magical stuff in the real world. You know what I yeah. mean? Like this is still like it's not like Harry Potter. Harry Potter's Harry Potter's great, but for the most part, you're in Hogwarts, every all the shit's magic. Everything, the walls, the everything like that. In this case, most of the world, and and we're gonna get into a little bit of that larger world in a second. Um, it, is is still real. So every magical moment of this is really contrasted by the otherwise grim reality it's surrounded by. Mm-hmm. Um. Oh, and then la- okay. So just I rereading this story. Um, do you remember Rufus Whedon? Wasn't he? Was he friend? Right? Or, uh... No, Rufus is the autistic kid. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so we'll explain a little bit his connection, but um, a character named Ellie Whedon, who is the um one of uh the father Rendell's old friends from high school. Uh, she's sort of uh, grown up and she has a son, Rufus, and he's uh, a child who has autism. And he is so much more a heroic character when I reread this. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's pivotal in stopping our villain, which we'll discuss in a moment. Um, but I want you to just remember about Rufus. He, I mean, he is he's so I mean, it's a very like sentimental tear jerking kind of character. Right. Um, because he is aware he has limitations cognitively to deal with these things, but no matter what happens, and a lot of bad stuff happens to this character, uh, especially in reference to the villain, uh, he it's very Fox and the Hound. Like, he just keeps trying <laughs> and finally is crucial in winning. I think it's he's such a wonderful character. So it's I'm not going to tell you too much because it would it would be hard to explain more without going into, like, you know, laborious sort of... Um, lines of of story but just look for him when you read this uh so he uh, you remember him yeah 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 Yeah. um Um, and then our villain this without further yeah um we've mentioned the name already um it goes by the name dodge or i mean technically it doesn't really have a name but it also refers to that's right itself as the legion um that's right and this entity the children of ling <laughs> yeah the this entity it's from the other side of the black door um it it possesses people it has so well throughout let's the, what let's lucas first and then because in the story we don't really know what is going on for a really long time you know what i mean like we don't know what he is mm-hmm we know that there is this in the beginning there's this lady in the well this sort of evil witch-like character. And, that entrances and the well, Yes, exactly. The, the, there's a well house and a corresponding key to the well house. And with the well, you can bring back things that the spirit of something that's dead. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's this awful loophole 
that kicks off the story, which is someone in if someone in the well, if a dead person in the the well house um, gets the anywhere key, they can get out of the well because they they can't go through the door of the well or they'll disappear because they're uh, just an echo. But the anywhere key allows them a kind of loophole, and that brings back this evil dead or this previously deceased evil character um named lucas caravaggio or luke Mm -hmm. um and the d and so once bode like it gets tricked into getting the anywhere key to the villain in our story that's when everything really gets kicked off and it turns out that luke is a friend of rendell's who was killed because he turned evil and we'll explain why in a second um but in order to get the keys, specifically the Omega key, the one that they're really looking for, um, sh- uh, does the gender key, uh, so uh, from a lady to a guy, um, and then poses as a character named Zach Wells, and Zach Wells ends up being a, 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 a undercover evil friend of our protagonists. Mm-hmm. Did I get that basically right? Pretty much. <laughs> Don't yeah. give him everything. Uh, Jeez. <laughs> I'm trying not to give him everything, but it's really hard to explain, like, you know, especially because, like, the thing we almost have to talk about and, like, you were about to talk about is why is why is Luke evil? No, because it's the Legion. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I was like, is this a trick question? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean... I know. I definitely think no matter how what we spoil, this is definitely going to be worth reading. And there's no really way to do this deep dive episode without spoiling key details. This is going to be the most spoily part. Mm-hmm. So if you're intrigued already, you should probably just go read it and then come back and hear us talk about it. But, um, but the idea is what it, the magic, so to speak, what's really underpinning this whole thing is a very Lovecraftian kind of thing. I mean, I mean, as a matter of the, fact, the town they're in is lovely. Yeah, and the first title, the first book is called welcome to lovecraft <laughs> that's right that's exactly right well this town it's, the town's called lovecraft but like if you weren't if you're not a fan of hp lovecraft or you didn't don't have a sense of him you know it's just a nice kind of easter egg mm-hmm. but the idea is in the 1770s under the house like before the, the house was just sort of newly created or whatever the benjamin Locke and a, a bunch of revolutionary uh um uh what do you call it what are they i mean soldiers uh <laughs> Yeah, soldiers, but I was thinking... Oh, just like, call them soldiers. Rebs, American. <laughs> anyway, yeah, okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, so um, while they're hiding from the British, they discover a doorway to a different, to another dimension, essentially, uh, filled with these Lovecraftian kind of demons. But the problem is, the demons can't come into our world directly, not physically. When they do, when they... Uh, the very being of the world, like the, not just the air, but something like that, kills them, and they turn into this iron-like sludge. It's going to be called the Whispering Iron. Um, and so uh, they they can't cross over that way. One thing they can do, though, is if uh, they if you go over into the um, the into their doorway or a, a, an encounter with it, there's a bit vague about whether you just have to look. Because certain characters look, but they don't get infected or whatever. But either way, a demon can, or whatever these things are, these sort of Lovecrafty and other things, they call them the children of Ling a couple times. It's not clear why. Um, they can graft onto your spirit, to your very soul, and corrupt you at a deep, deep level. Um, and it only happens to a few characters. Now, uh, you still with me now? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh, but yeah, so it, it only happens to a few characters, and, and many of which die. But the one that ends up being deeply resilient is the demon that attaches itself to the soul of this character, Luke Caravaggio, a.k.a. Zach Wells. Mm-hmm. And a.k.a. the lady in the mission, well. <laughs> the lady in the well, exa- exactly. The dark being or something like mm-hmm. that. Um, his entire mission is to find the key to the door that, uh, th- that uh, ends up getting locked. Um, so he can get more of his uh, reinforcements, so to speak. Um, um, it's the Omega key, and it's they. The Omega. <laughs> That's true. That's yeah, <laughs> very, very true. And it is, yeah. And so, um, but because uh, only the kids, specifically Tyler, for most of the story, knows where the Omega key is, uh, Dodge can't just kill the kids and take it because he he doesn't know where it is. So most, uh, a lot of the meat of our story is. 
Dodge sort of like slowly, it's almost like a hand the rocks, the cradle style kind of, you know, thriller, Mm -hmm. you know, where he's trying to get this information, pretending to be their friend while also killing a bunch of people who get in his way, you know, surreptitiously. Yep. Um, and it's easy to forget that a huge element of our story is that kind of like, it's just like this man, this sort of like serial killer style character going around and like uh, trying to like find this information, find out where this key is before anyone discovers him. And if they do, he ruthlessly and just gruesomely murders them. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you forget it until he does murder. I mean, he murders like 12 people in this Story. So many people. <laughs> so I mean, there's. The, I don't want tons of murder. Do you remember? Do you remember Bode's friend? I'm not going to say much more. Past no, that. stop. You said too much. Do you rem- <laughs> no, do you remember? I'm not going to tell them, but do you remember? Yes, Bode doesn't have that many friends. <laughs> I know it's so much. I mean, yeah, it, this thing holds no punches. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Let's just and, say there's uh, there's there's death with demons. There's death with a bus. There's death with the bathtubs. There's deaths with stabbings and breaking necks. I mean, there's tons, tons of deaths <laughs> caused. It's a lot. Oh, by oh Dodge. and, and I, yeah, and I forgot to mention, and I think that's crucial too. Those demons that tried to come over, but the world itself killed them and turned them into this disgusting metal. The whispering that's what iron. The keys are made that's of. the very metal mm-hmm. that the keys are made out yeah. of. Turns out that Ben Benjamin Locke was a bit of literally a locksmith, like a literal, you know, ironsmith and locksmith. And so he used these, the metal to make these keys as weapons and literally to lock up the door that would hold these creatures at bay. I mean, some fucking weapons, if you can't fucking remember them when you're an adult. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and this was the point about Rivel's rules, which was that they were at some level really terrified these things would be used for evil. Right. Um. So there's a kind of, and it also is just a wonderful little literary mm-hmm. device. So like to explain why, because what's funny too, is that I think a lot of the way this story is even allowed to function as a realistic sort of, um, uh, like, I don't know, exploration of trauma and grief is that for the most part, our protagonists don't really know much about the underlying reality yeah. that's going on. Yeah. That's a you big know, they don't theme know about the book. The... Go ahead. No, I said that's a big theme of the book. Oh, just that they're unaware. Yeah, I mean, it's because they kind of discover things as they go. I mean, nobody's handing them a manual. Their dad's dead. He doesn't even remember anyway. So they're kind of just figuring it out as they go. Um, and I, I can't, I don't know if I'm misremembering this. I think, uh, no, no, it's in the story. Uh, I was going to say maybe it's something else I read, but no, it's in the story. Um, and to, to, underscore your point about it being a theme in the book where you know zach or the lady in the water tells boat it's like you only know like the this is the end of a story not the beginning you know that's kids always think that they're in the beginning of a story but they're really at the end of Mm -hmm. it you know meaning that like all this history that the kids are unaware of has absolutely like crucially affected their life that's true of um you know, uh, obviously Sam and his history and everything like that. Oh, and uh, I don't want to give too much away, but the, even um, Rindle's death is due to mistakes that he made earlier. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. There's a, and, like it's like uh, a lot. Some of the story is told like non chronologically, also. So I mean, that's, that's right. why it's kind of hard to explain it, and also why we can't explain some things without explaining other things. So it sounds like we're giving a lot away. Yeah. But we're not. <laughs> That's true. I mean, and that, yeah, absolutely. And and the truth is, is, this book doesn't really work on the basis of like, you know, um, absolutely up upheavally or like, what's the word like, um, you know, secrets that or or twists that mm-hmm. you know completely change your perspective. There there are, there's information you discover along the way that's helpful or insightful or interesting. But for the most part, the developments are more like enhancing or enriching, or they they unfold parts of it. It isn't so much that you think it's one way, but it turns out to be another or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, if anything, you find out just how disturbing the Joe things Hill you is. already knew. Oh. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. <laughs> Um, so, but uh, yeah, wh- we need we should move to favorite moments because I'm actually curious what yours is. I have okay, so I mean, I really one have so many. 
Okay. No, no, no. No, fair enough. Um, so I think what I'm, I'm really fascinated by is um, we read these in trade originally, right? So, and that, I mean, I, I didn't, I wasn't uh, savvy enough to collect them in single issues. But when you go back, especially after a few readings, you realize, oh, there are certain uh, issues that are um, like they just told a single story. Mm hmm. And it forwarded the plot, but it's, you know, you can tell it's a single story. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, if I had to pick, like, I think my favorite moment, um, and the, of many, like we said, mm -hmm. um, I really think it's the ghost fight. Do you remember that? Say more. There's a few ghosts it's, in the it's, story. That's, that, that's true. There's a few <laughs> ghost fights. Um, it, so, um, when Sam Lesser gets killed after coming, uh, you know, coming after the family a second time, um, he's thrown through the ghost door. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. yeah, and he, you know, and they think he's dead and his body's actually cremated. So his, like, yeah, you know, his up. ghost is just, like, free range, <laughs> you know. Um, and uh, Zach, the, or, or, uh, you know, our, our, or Dodge, yeah, our, our villain in Zach form goes and checks on him and tries to make a deal. But Sam kind of realizes what he is. And they get into a really cool Frighteners style ghost mm -hmm. fight, you know, where they can change their physical or like ghostly forms. Yeah, yeah. Like, with, you know, like Sam turns his arm into a chainsaw and Zach uses his fencing sword or whatever, his rapier. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's super cool. But also, it's the first time that we see what's attached to Zach's spirit. And it's very disturbing. So I, I love the episodic nature of this. It's like this cool, sort of longer moment within the story. It's visually beautiful. It really exploits how cool horror comics can be, and also tells a, a moves the story along in a very radical way. Uh, so I love that. And then uh, this isn't a moment. I'll just say anything with Rufus. <laughs> I mean, that's very <laughs> true. Uh, mine. I feel like it's a cop out, maybe, but it's not. I love the beginning of it when Bode is like getting entranced by the w woman in the well and like you're starting to yeah. find little things like just before shit hits the fan because I felt like in those moments you really got to know the characters and could you could see where their places are and kind of how they are and then when Bode starts finding the keys and it's this weird little like Tyler's dealing with his mom Kinsey's trying to be a rebel badass and Bode's like I found these keys and they're great nobody else wants to use them I'm gonna have fun with it but then he lets fucking Satan loose out of the well but yeah. they, I don't know I just I really love the the beginning of it it's it's probably one of my favorite yeah. parts in the whole thing and Bode is probably I mean unassumingly became one of my favorites in the whole story so absolutely yeah I mean the, that moment <laughs> <laughs> yeah well that but that period in the uh in the story is just so pregnant mm -hmm. with story i like, don't there's so much like happening all at once so i good. don't like that you just described that as pregnant <laughs> it's uh it's baby oh, okay, oh, baby. okay. <laughs> Gross. um it, it's yeah so one of the reasons why we're doing this is because the Netflix, the Netflix, geez, Louise, I just hung out with my grandparents. Um, <laughs> one of the reasons why we're doing this is Netflix is coming out with the show. But did you know that it was almost a show twice and almost a movie once? <laughs> that stands to reason. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't know that, but I do think that like... I'm, I'm, they, I'm sure they could just waiting to like interpret. This. Yeah. So in 2014 at Comic Con, there was supposed to be a film trilogy, and they were going to release it in 2015. Um, then that didn't work. Then um, Fox was going to do it. They did a a TV pilot. It was going to come out in 2010. Also didn't work. Then Hulu was going to pick it up in 2017. That didn't work either. And then Netflix came and saved the day in 2020. And Joe Hill was like, you know what? I'll just, I'll do it. Like, I'll, I'll, I'll write this and I will make sure it's fine. Because <laughs> for some reason, well, I... they call it cursed. Because every time it's being worked on, I believe the Hulu one was actually going to be done by the director that did it. So, like, there was big names on that one and it just didn't go anywhere. Well, I have to say, uh, I've seen the trailer and, you know, I think trailers are subject to a lot of, um, 
not not disinformation exactly, but false expectations at least. It looks, um, and so the trailer. M- it looks ma- bad. To okay, me. it doesn't look bad. I mean, yeah. If you've read the books, it kind of, it's a little jarring because the tone is really weird. But that's right. It could just be all the happy moments <laughs> thing that they're showing. Yeah, the, the, I mean, but. That's true, and that the song, the music specifically, I think might be misleading because the um, it feels very Disney Channel to me. But I have to admit, not, a lot of that might be the music. I think it feel the way the trailer makes it feel is uh, Narnia with keys. Yes, and which I love Narnia, but that's not lock and key. So I'm I'm hesitant to see exactly what they will do with this because it. It did seem really bright and colorful in some places, which in the book there is, but like, I don't know. There was blood. So, I mean, I mean, there will be blood. What, what makes me feel not great about it? Um, and again, I, I, you know, it's, I feel like I'm channeling Kayla almost a little bit. Like, I'd love to be wrong about this in this case. I want this to be good. Now, at some level, I've read the comic three times, so I almost just don't give a shit. If it's good, great. If not, I can always read the comics, and I think that's like the right attitude to have. They can't take away what's already been amazing and wonderful. Um, that being said, uh, it's like this. This is, um, you know, in a lot of ways, equal parts horror and whimsy. Mm. And what I'm getting from that trailer is max whimsy yeah, uh, with low horror. Um, and hopefully that's, hopefully I'm wrong. Hopefully we get I mean, a lot of, of dark. I believe one of the producers or person that's doing it worked on Preacher. So that's yeah. not too promising as far as like if you want a good apt- adaptation of the comic into yeah. the thing i mean i don't know like it's hard it's hard to but say but the thing is like i'll be completely okay with it if it's good you know what i mean it's just another um, interpretation of it uh, from what i've seen and heard joe hill talk about that they're going to go in a different directions from the book did so it's going to be like a walking dead situation where like to sure. follow the general, like, this is what's happening, but different things will happen. Because I think they showed one of the keys. I can't even remember which one, but they found it a different way than they did in the book. And I'm like, oh, okay, this is going to be different. I, ironically, that's maybe I like that better. That, like, it's like if they're going to change the tone, I think I'd rather just have a different story yeah. that has, like is kind of parallel Mm -hmm. rather than have a straight up like retelling. Like I don't want another Zack Snyder Watchmen, which it wasn't awful. I'm not (laughs) shitting. Don't say that the the Snyder cut people attack us. Yeah. They can go eat a bag of dicks anyway. So let's see what's wrong uh, with that. But okay. (laughs) <laughs> the Snyder Cut people are so they're flat earthers. <laughs> okay, we got it. Move for, on for from comics. that. <laughs> anyway, well, here's but here's the point, which is that Watchmen was a one to one translation, but the tone was sort of off, mm-hmm. and it's like Zack Snyder didn't understand that that was a satire, um, <laughs> and so similarly, it's like I don't want a one to one with a with a kind of where they mess the tone up. Give me another story. Let's have some keys and some fun. I'm all about that. So that's that'll be a saving grace. Last thing about this trailer, um, we need a renaissance of casting directors. Um, Casting directors are a huge problem uh, in certain properties. They're connected to a lot of marketing, which is fine up to a point. Here's the thing. When I saw the kid that was playing Tyler, I was like, oh, they got a model. Mm. Fantastic. Mm. It happens all the time. It happened in Perks of Being a Wallflower. Um, Here's an audio uh, analogy for you. If you listen to radio especially pre-podcast style radio. Uh, the disc jockeys have a tendency to talk like this. Welcome. We're going to talk about lock and key today. This is going to be really good. Uh, no one tells them to talk that way. <laughs> they just think they're supposed to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No one likes it. It's a, and so and it's really gone out of fashion because of of podcasts. But the point is, is that that and very similarly, this movie does not benefit. Or sorry, show. Sorry, does not benefit from a very model attractive looking kid. When you look at Tyler, the whole point is that he's like kind of a normal dude. I mean, by like and casting standards, that kid is normal. <laughs> I He is, but I, 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 here's my thinking on it and why I think it's important. It means they prioritized something mm. 
that against the idea of like the acting chops of the person. Yeah, I mean, you know what I mean? They were fearful that since this property is not well known, that they needed to get some good looking people on it, I guess. Um, I mean, I, I suppose love that it's, Georgie you look is at, playing Bode, so that's cool. Hey, very good. Well, all, all kids look, you know, cute. <laughs> all like, kids you know, look know, There the aren't same. many ugly... Yeah, they're not... I mean, you know, not ugly kids for the most part. But the other thing is that, like, what I'm describing, uh, you you can see it get real bad. The CW is this problem written Don't large. Those people are... CW. No, but it's very... I understand, but it's very true. They They cast those people. They're all models, and none of them can act. And it's very clear that if you just fix the casting in the CW, you would fix half of the problem. Yeah, yeah, I, agree. I mean, anyway, I agree. so that's that's a rant unto itself. <laughs> I mean, I'm yeah. hesitantly excited. I think it comes out the week we release this, or maybe oh, I'm gonna watch the end of every the I don't know ish or episode. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you've read the comic. Let us know what you think. And then when you watch the TV show, let us know what you think. And then if you don't like either of them, then listen to one of our other episodes. Should have said that in the beginning. Well, please do. <laughs> please do. But I, I really, I mean, I don't know how you could not like this. I, w- I want to say that this story is, a, it's a beautiful piece of literature. Mm. This is, I mean, this is one of my favorite horror fictions. This is one of my favorite novels. It just happens to be a graphic oh, novel. Um, I will say... um, like if you don't want to shell out the cash to buy all you know the novels and stuff, um, they did an audio drama form of it, and it actually I think it either won awards or got nominated for you know the top audiobook or audio drama awards. Um, I've heard some of it; it's really good. Like it's so good that you don't necessarily need to see the pictures to understand what's happening. Like, they really Absolutely. paint the scene with it. I'm just saying, like, it's another way that, like, you know, if you're listening to this and you don't really want to spend money on six kind of trades of the comp, the, the books or whatever, there's other ways you can get the story. But just read it. It's so good. Give it a chance. Yeah. The, 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 this is kind of like our recommendation uh, section. Like, uh, Noah's recommending the audio section. I'm going to re-recommend these comics because I'm, I'm holding them right now, or one of them at least. And um, it's IDW. We forgot to mention that before, but I that's important, it. right? They're, they're the publisher. Uh, I, we forgot to both mention it in unison. And anyway, <laughs> no, no. Uh, uh, but anyway, but the thing is, is that because... So this isn't talked about enough. I mean, I love Marvel and DC, but if you get a, a, a graphic uh, novel or trade or you know anything hardback... Um, or or paperback uh, from anything but Marvel and DC, it'll be about fifteen dollars less. Oh yeah, and these are uh, physically some of the most gorgeous graphic novels, like the hardcover. Like they have like those like uh, the letters feel like braille. You know it's what I mean? Like em- embossed, kind of. Yeah, like it's like they pop out a little bit. Yeah, yeah. The art's beautiful. It's a f- it's a substantive thing in your hands. Mm-hmm. It even has that little like number or sorry, that little ribbon bookmark thing. Oh yeah. Those are really nice. I want them to come out with a big collection of them and you need like seven keys to unlock it. To read it. (laughs) That's, that would be awesome. But, but yeah, just to (laughs) remind people, these are, these things are $25 and if Marvel or DC put them out, they'd be like 45. Oh yeah. Yeah. They're, they're hefty books. So uh, yes. So I'm just saying, awesome uh deal mm-hmm. i mean guess that's it that's yeah that's please awesome. read lock and key yeah. it's amazing and watch thank you joe hill and go ahead gabriel sorry. rodriguez yeah i was say thank you for making this yeah. we love you it's a fantastic <laughs> he's never gonna hear this i wish he'd hear this <laughs> if somebody if one we'll of you knows later. joe back hill issues. send this to him and tell him that please these do nerds are gushing about his work that'd be great Absolutely. And then tell, tell Stephen King to hit me up because Stephen King's one of my favorite writers of all time. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I'll leave it on that note. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thanks for listening. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at The Phantom Zone Pod for more podcast updates.